uh, articles to read about uh, different perspectives about whether or not we should be concerned about coronavirus, if people are making a big deal about it, why there's media, mass media covering this and not other more important issues. And so there's been a lot of confusion of whether we should take this seriously, whether we should not take this seriously. Um, And so we're here today in our medical sociology class, and we're going to be talking about why, as medical sociologists, we look at this from a different lens than looking at statistics and saying, okay, the statistics are low, uh, babies and, and, and young people aren't dying, so it's not a big deal, right? So one of the students actually just sent me an article right before we jumped onto this live um, that was an excellent, excellent article and that I will forward to all of you after this class is over. And the article discusses uh, what populations are going to be harmed by coronavirus. Um, So as you remember in our last class, we talked about euthanasia or assisted suicide, and we talked about abortion. And we talked about whose lives matter in our country and how we address that. And then we went into talking about marginalized groups that are protected by by our law, such as those with disabilities, those are part of the LGBTQ community, men or sex and gender, race, color, socioeconomic, socioeconomic groups aren't currently covered, but they're a big factor in this discussion. Age is one of the protected classes, and that's all part of medical sociology, right? Because as medical sociologists, what we believe is that we have contributed more to the decrease in mortality globally and nationally than medicine has per se, right? Because we know that the two vaccines that have actually contributed to lower mortality rates are smallpox and polio, whereas the other ones haven't necessarily contributed. But as medical sociologists, we're looking at social factors that contribute to the decrease of mortality and illnesses internationally and nationally. And so with coronavirus, as medical sociologists, we have to consider those marginalized groups because they're a huge part of the lens that we take with medical sociology. So who can tell me which groups typically prevail whenever there's an outbreak or illness? What groups of people and populations typically prevail? class, right? Always upper class, higher SES, socioeconomic status, absolutely. Those that ha- are in positions, those with insurance, yeah, usually that has to do with SES as well. Awesome. Good job, guys. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, good. You're listening. I'm glad. Okay. So those that are wealthier and have access to resources, remember what we talked about earlier in the semester, they don't just have access to those resources, during uh, times of crisis. They have times to preventative medicine and other resources before a crisis hits, right? So they might be in better health. They might have access to better um, physician care or preventative care. They might have lower stress levels. Stress is a huge factor when it comes to illness, right? As we talked about in class, if someone's facing debt, they're in a uh, lower socioeconomic bracket, they're going to have much higher stress than someone that's more well-off. And so they're going to be more prone to illness than someone otherwise. So that's huge. And in this particular case... We have a group of people, regardless of socioeconomic status, that are less prone to the coronavirus. Who can tell me what group that is? Healthy and younger. That's right, okay. Younger people, yep. Definitely not babies, but yep. People below the age of 60, yes. Younger, yes. Youth, yes. Younger people educated under 60s, yes. Okay, perfect. Those are the answers. People around our age without chronic illnesses or conditions that could contribute to having more issues with a condition like this, right? So we have a very privileged group of people that are in a position of higher immunity resistance and 
access, most likely access to resources because they don't fall into certain categories. However, you have to think, right? Because of the different things we've talked about, like black women's maternal health, those with disabilities that usually already have issues with immune system, possibly having um, more susceptibility to pneumonia. Um, what about men and women? Uh, remember, we talk about men are less likely to seek care in certain situations than women. That's another factor that we don't fully know or has been developed in this situation. Um, those of color, right? Black maternal health, what's gonna, what's gonna happen to the already devastating state of black women's maternal health? What we know is going on in Italy is that the women that are pregnant right now aren't really getting the care they need because hospitals are overwhelmed with patients coming in for coronavirus. Now just imagine, given our conversations about, about black women's maternal health, how that's going to impact groups of color that are already marginalized in the conversation, how it's going to affect those that maybe are facing gender transitions, um, or sex changes, I mean, um, or come from other marginalized gender groups as well. How are they going to be able to receive access specifically to their situations? How about those that come from socioeconomic groups where they don't have access? How about considering groups that come from hourly pay categories, for instance. So if you're on salary right now, if you work at Chapman, if you're a student at Chapman, we have the resources to set up virtual communication and we're able to get up and running. No one's going to lose pay. No one's going to lose education. You're still going to be able to graduate. If you're uh, supposed to graduate this semester, it's going to be okay. It's a little bit shifty for us, right? It's a little bit stressful. But for the most part, we're not going to suffer dramatically or be completely impacted by this. But think about those that perhaps are hourly employees, maybe those that are uh, in the hospitality industry for hotels that are not receiving business. They're going to cut them first, right? Because they don't have beds to be cleaned. They don't have hotels to be cleaned. Um, obviously, workers on airlines, restaurants, people that are, that are in the lower bracket of the socioeconomic pool that are not going to have work. Part-time workers, right, without paid time off. People in those situations are going to be hit really hard, and they might fall into the young, healthy adult category, perhaps, right? Not always, because obviously we have a large proportion of the population um, that, that will fall into that category as well. Uh, but think about the devastating effects. As they are worried about their pay, making their bills, providing food for their family and for themselves, their access to medical care goes dramatically down, right? And so this is going to impact people in very unusual and unexpected ways. And once again, it's going to further the socioeconomic divide about access to resources and whose lives matter and whose don't. And so a lot of the conversations that are being had, and you guys as students fall into that category, right? You're young, you're healthy, you don't, most of you, I know a couple of you do, but the majority of you don't have underlying conditions where you need to be worried about something like coronavirus. You know it might just uh, affect you like a light cold or a flu, and you'll be able to overcome it, and that's great. Um, however, the big concern with coronavirus is that we don't know enough about it, right? So with the flu, you go into your doctor, they'll prescribe a certain regimen, they'll tell you how long you need to wait before going into contact with other people. Um, they'll give you they'll give you remedies, they'll, they'll, they'll know what the recovery rate might look like, um, they'll know what to do in an emergency situation, so on and so forth. But with coronavirus, it's evolving and it mutates and no one really knows a lot about it. And so the panic is coming from the unknown. Right, And what medical professionals, what epidemiologists are really concerned about right now is the unknown. We don't have enough information about coronavirus to not be worried. And that's why later in this class, I'm going to be shifting the curriculum where we cut out some of the readings and we're going to go into an investigation of pandemics and epidemics over the history of time in America or in, the, in our in our society and globally uh, because it gives some hints as to what happens when we don't disseminate information when we don't know what to do in certain circumstances so what do we know about coronavirus so far what are some things that we do know 
about how it's impacting us. We know some of the symptoms, right? We know some of the symptoms for some people, but we don't know the full extent because as epidemiologists have been telling us is that it's constantly mutating and we can't keep track of it. Absolutely, there's definitely going to be economic impact and supply chain problems for sure, which will definitely impact health factors, um, but that is also something that um, we would talk more in the economic department. Since we shut down of resources, yes, shut down of resources, yeah. Mm -hmm. Spread through coffee and sneezing, yeah. Symptoms take up to two weeks to develop. Okay, yeah, so, so, so sim symptoms take up to two weeks to develop. So you can be a carrier without knowing it. That is huge. That's a big deal. However, we don't even know how long they incubate for or who can carry it or who don't, right? Young people can spread it but are not severely impacted by it. Totally, right. So, yeah, CJ, so definitely. So, as we said before, a lot of people that are younger and healthy, like you guys, are going out and saying, hey, it's not going to hurt me. Let's go get on a plane. Let's go out to Disneyland. Let's go do whatever. Uh, thinking that it's not going to impact them. But that's the problem, right? That's the problem, thinking it's not going to impact me. And going forward, carrying it, touching things, bringing it, bringing it different places where people that are highly at risk could get it. Quarantine is being used as a method, yeah, for sure. Exaggeration through mass media. So let's talk about that. So that's a big, 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 big part of the pro or problem, maybe not so much a problem, right, is the media. Think about 20, 30, 40 years ago. Media looked very, very different, right? And just think about medical sociology. Medical sociology is relatively new. The practice of medicine started well before medical sociology, right? We talked about lobotomies. We talked about uh, different things that happened with experimentation in the medical industry. We talked about how medicine was never really helpful at certain periods of time, right? We talked about uh, briefly about times such as the Salem witch trials where medicine was uh, quite bizarre using leeches to take blood out of people that are sick so that it could drain their system. There was so much about medicine that was completely bogus and inaccurate, just based on a lot of baseless information uh, that didn't really have much merit. And so what happened over time, and we're also going to talk about as soon as we go into like the business of being born and things like that, is that finally a discipline was created in the field of medical sociology where epidemiologists would come together, right? Remember we talked about the, the, the race to find a cure of cancer and how what was really found was that it was not going to be cured by medicine, but it was going to be cured by prevention, right? By medical sociology. Remember, alcohol and tobacco being found to be the two biggest determinants of those that are, having, uh, are going to have cancer later on. And so it's the same thing, right? As medical sociologists, we come in and we say, hey, what factors are contributing to illnesses? Because we don't have the resource to cure anyone, and we probably won't. And even if we did, it could get to a point where it's just out of our hands. So as medical sociologists, the most important thing that we can do is find out what societal factors, environmental factors are contributing to illnesses, such as epidemics and pandemics, and disseminate information, right? Knowledge is power. Knowledge is the, the means by which medical sociology has helped to alleviate a lot of issues that we have in our society, right? With the exception of things like smallpox and polio, which were largely cured, or, well, not cured, but eliminated, um, though polio isn't fully eliminated yet by things like the vaccine. But that, too, took education and dissemination of information. So what's happening with the media right now is that we have a newfound knowledge, right? People are saying, why now? Why this epidemic? Why this pandemic? Why are we talking about this so much now in the media when our death toll is so low? But as medical sociologists, you have to look and say, oh, maybe the lower rates could be contributed to because of media. 
Maybe because we were quick to disseminate information, maybe because we were quick to get people to understand they need a quarantine, maybe that's why we're seeing lower rates of mortality for this, right? Because we know that there's no medicines right now that can cure or stop you from getting coronavirus. What we do know is that there's social environmental factors that can contribute to the lessening of mortality rates. And what we saw in China, what we saw in Italy, was that that came too slow, right? There wasn't enough media coverage. There wasn't enough prevention taking place. And so what we saw was a rise in deaths and the rise in the spread of, of, of the virus. And so you could say, hypothetically, what I've been hearing a lot in the media, you could definitely say, hey, it's killing less people than, than the flu. It's killing less people than tuberculosis. It's killing less people than uh, malaria. It's killing less people than a dozen other illnesses. That may be true, but the speed at which it is taking over highly industrialized nations is impeccable and is significant, right? And the amount of knowledge that we have about it is also very limited. And so those two factors together, that those two factors together are contributing to a virus such as this taking over our entire global economy is alarming, right? Um, so say I concur in general I'm anti-alarmist media, but in instance it seems to be a necessary precautionary measure. Yeah, totally. So, so what the media is doing is what we've been trained to do. It's what we as medical sociologists and communication specialists within the National Institutes of Health and other, organization, uh, other organizations have learned is that it's really important. That's it. That's what. That's the goal right now. The NIH, the CDC. What they want is for the media to be covering this because we want to contain it as fast as possible. What we don't want is a global panic where people are stealing face masks from hospitals, right? Uh, stealing sanitizer from storage where they're making resources inaccessible to the populations that need them most. And that's where you see CDC officials come out and saying, don't buy masks. If you're healthy, you don't need them and things like that, right? And so we're being encouraged not to uh, consume certain resources that other people uh, are more in need of. Exactly. So, as Ryan said, we have an ethical responsibility to keep ourselves healthy for the betterment of at-risk population. Exactly. And so, what we're seeing here is actually really promising. Though it is going to be devastating to our economies, absolutely, what we're seeing is actually a consideration uh, for... A, a larger part of our community, understanding that we're all going to be elderly at some point. What happens when you are 60 plus years old and the media says, hey, it's no big deal. Few citizens are coming out and saying this virus is no big deal because you're 60 now and you don't matter. What about when you become disabled and you are prone to medical issues and the media or citizens come out and say, oh, it's no big deal, go out and play because you don't matter to society. In the same types of discussions that we've had about euthanasia and abortions for those with disabilities, we're sending the same implicit messages to people that come from different populations that they don't matter, right? When we completely marginalize them and say, hey, healthy people are going to be okay, and so we shouldn't worry about this, it's just a cold, what we're saying to the populations that are at risk is that you don't matter, right? So yeah, we do. We have an, we have an ethical responsibility to keep ourselves healthy and also to be global citizens, because not only, uh, not only realizing those marginalized populations, now we also have to think about nations that don't have access to resources. We have to think about the continent of Africa, that certain parts of Africa, that if, if they become infected with this virus, it will be completely devastating because of the lessened access to resources that they have in certain under-industrialized nations. And then once they once 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 they become inundated with this, it could wipe out it could wipe out a, a great uh, a great part of their population, right? 
So someone said, I think our generation needs to realize we might be okay if we get it or we might not even get it, but we can spread it so easily that we should help and take care of everyone else. Yeah, absolutely. Let's say medical complications are very less in it. Freezing on me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good, guys. Okay. So, takeaway from this is that we don't have medication for this. We don't know enough about it to develop a medication for this. And if we did develop some sort of vaccine for this, there's no way. We don't even have enough test kits right now to understand who's actually experiencing issues from coronavirus, never mind disseminating a vaccine that might not even help or that might cause more issues, right? So this is a big, big issue. So let's talk about that as well. So we see the numbers uh, appearing to be low, right? We see numbers in the media right now saying, oh, this proportion of the population is getting coronavirus and even a much smaller a fraction of that population is dying from the illness. However, what we do know in states like California is that there is a huge shortage of the testing kits for coronavirus. So those numbers are extremely artificially low. We don't know the magnitude of how it's impacting people until we do autopsies. We won't know until years later until we gather all of the data to really find out how it's impacted us. And then additionally, we don't know how it's going to mutate and how it's going to look. And we don't know if someone's going into a hospital and all of a sudden they're dying from diabetes or another pre-existing condition and we never tested them for coronavirus, right? So we don't know what triggered the illness. And so we see a lot of that going on. A lot of that going on, right? So the numbers that you see right now they're significant because they're artificially low, because they're not really representative of who's actually being impacted by coronavirus and who's actually dying from coronavirus. So what's the, what, we have a question, what's the best way to control this right now? I think the best way to control this right now is what we've been seeing. Oh, sorry, I'm reading another comment. So what we've been seeing, is, the CDC is recommending, right? Avoiding going to crowded places, keeping your hands washed, not touching your nose and mouth. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of counsel given to us not to purchase masks um, because there's populations that, that need it more than we do. Um, and, and what is the reason? Who knows the reason why, um, as a healthy person, that you would possibly want to wear a mask? Who knows the reason for that? others yeah okay so so we'll go to that in a sec so one person said if they did develop a vaccine do you think it would help our current situation the, the answer to that is we don't know right when the rotavirus vaccine first came out it was killing so many infants right they were getting uh they were getting a uh, gosh i forget the condition that it was called um but anyways infants were dying from it because we didn't know a lot about it it was coming out and they were getting it too early we just don't know what would happen so again we turn to medical sociology and it w which states that medicine's not going to solve this prevention's going to solve this social factors is going to solve this and better understanding the implications that societal and environmental factors have is going to solve this so going to masks so why why are masks something that could help a healthy person? Well, if you're already healthy and you don't feel like you're experiencing symptoms of coronavirus, yeah, to protect people, masks are used to protect people um, if you're already sick, right? Because you're not sneezing and coughing on them and you're not spreading the, the, the um, wet fragments. But if you're a healthy person, the big reason that you would want to wear a mask is so that you're not touching your nose and your mouth because that's the, the best way to spread the virus is because your hands carry a lot of the germs. And so though you're being advised not to wear a mask if you're healthy, it could help you. It definitely could help you and it could help you from the transmission as well. So definitely don't go out and buy all the masks that the hospitals need right now, but you know, maybe try a bandana or something, a makeshift mask if you feel worried about it. 
Um, how do you prevent hysteria while still taking the issue seriously? Um, I think that's what we do as medical sociologists, right? Where we realize that it could possibly not impact us, um, but we realize that it could devastate marginalized populations, those that have pre-existing conditions like diabetes, um, disabilities, uh, where they have uh, malfunctioning lungs uh, by touching your eyes. Yes, you can transmit corona by touching your eyes. Yes. If, if you have the illness on your hands. I think masks are meant for people who are already sick in terms of helping spread it to people who don't have it. Yes, that's what masks, that's what we're being encouraged right now is to only use the mask if we're already sick um, so that we don't transmit it. However, like I said, if you are a healthy person, a mask is helpful so you don't touch your nose and your mouth because studies have shown um, that those that, uh, that, that all people pretty much touch their nose and mouth without realizing within an hour, 20 to 30 times. So keeping your hands clean and uh, not touching your face. I thought healthy people who wear masks could be constantly touch and readjust their mask, which leads to more face touching. Um, I don't know much about that. Uh, if you're wearing it properly and not touching, it should help. Same as what I am concerned about your young children. How are you handling this to mom? Um, yeah, you know... Um, the media says it's not affecting children as much, right? Um, and so I, I like to believe that for sure. So definitely feel a little bit less concerned about all the children. Um, however, it depends on the child, right? So I have two children, one that's had pneumonia um, four times in her short five-year life. Um, and so that's concerning, right? That's really concerning because she's predisposed to um, the respiratory issues. I also have a two-year-old that's uh, been hospitalized almost um, 12, 14 times time since he was born um, for respiratory issues as well. So it's really concerning uh, for those children, whereas the other ones are not. Um, so definitely taking precautions with that. I think when people are just completely unconcerned about their children, um, maybe they just don't realize the potential impacts that it could have. But again, you, you, you're you not just doing this to be concerned for yourself or your children. You're doing this because you want to be part of my last touch of faith. Um, so you want to be concerned about the society, uh, society and our globe at large. How is this going to impact continents like Africa? That if they are hit with this, it will be completely devastating to them if they don't have the same infrastructure and medical treatment or access to preventative medicine. How is it going to impact less industrialized nations? Right? How is it going to, not just that they're less industrialized in terms of medicine, but let's think about water access and sewage systems, right? So in the U.S., some of the biggest preventative measures uh, to increase or decrease mortality rates has been fresh water, access to fresh water, drinking water, and sewage systems, having cleanliness. That's something that hasn't been available, that wasn't available in our country, like, for instance, during the bubonic plague or or the, um, the Spanish flu of 1918, right? So having, having clean streets, having sewage systems, things like that, they help with the prevention of spread of disease. And think about nations or communities where they don't have that type of infrastructure in place that could completely devastate them. Do I think that switching to online school is the best way to prevent the spread of COVID, especially if social gatherings are still occurring? Um, I think I think there's uh, several reasons why schools are doing it, right? Liability being a big one, um, but I think also concern for the transmission uh, to to the elderly, those with disabilities, those with pre-existing conditions. I think it's it's definitely a safe move, and I think that we as I think that we as a society uh, should be concerned about our fellow citizens. I think we should be concerned, like I said, when we already have some of the highest infant mortality rates for black women and, and maternal health care, I think we should be concerned how that's going to impact them as well. Because this doesn't just impact a small percentage of the population. This is going to have a ripple effect on different marginalized groups already in our medical system. And as we know, America being a more developed nation, we have some of the highest mortality rates when it comes to maternal health. And we have some of the highest, highest issues when it comes to preventative medicine. So 
we've got big issues here too, aside from uh, less industrialized nations. And so I think us taking this seriously, taking the precautions to shut down schools and things like that, um, I think that's a, a smart, though hard move on a lot of these universities and schools. I think all schools should shut down in affected areas because children can still carry the virus to parents. Or do you think the impact of shutting down grade schools is not worth it? That's hard to say, right? You have a lot of people pulling on different sides of the aisle for this. You're going to go sit on your economics class, and they're going to have a totally different perspective on coronavirus than you are in medical sociology. But here today, we're in medical sociology looking at coronavirus through a medical sociology lens, for sure. If I'm in business class right now, I'm going to be talking about the devastating effects on businesses and how that's going to impact our economy. But in medical sociology, we're here to we're here to look at um, we're here to look at this from a sociological lens. Let's see. Can that's a good question. If Chapman is encouraged us to go home, if we can, is that just increasing travel and potential for spreading? That's a tough question. I think they're doing that for, I think right now they think it's contained enough. More spreading. Sorry, there was one question that disappeared. I can't answer it. Um, I think they're, they feel it's contained enough where within this sensitive period of time you could travel home and you'll be okay because what a lot of Epidemiologists are foreseeing as this getting worse, and so they don't want you to be stuck in a place without access to your family and resources. Um, so I think it's probably the best move right now. <coughs> okay, so we talked about media. We talked about why media coverage on this is a good thing. We talked about that. It's going to impact a lot more populations, right? So think about all the different populations we've talked about throughout the duration of this course that have been impacted by sociological and enviro or environmental factors and resulting in higher mortality rates. All of those populations that we've already discussed that are already hurting are going to be impacted by this for sure. And then let's talk about let's talk about the inundation of uh, the medical system, right? Like we just talked about in Italy, what's going on in Italy and China, not having enough hospital beds and having to make the hard choice about whose lives matter. And how are we going to make those choices, right? Whose lives matter? Well, what did we say at the very beginning of this lecture? Whose lives tend to matter during crisis? Who? If you have Joe from the south side, right, Libby, thank you, wealthy, powerful, thank you. If you have Joe from the south side of Chicago that's black and his wife that is also black and pregnant with a black baby and they're coming to the hospital to get treated um, for whatever, you know, maybe she's going to labor, maybe they do have coronavirus, and then you have the wealthy white CEO coming in in Chicago because he runs the hospital, who do you think is going to get treatment first? Who do you think? Okay, you guys are all doing your homework. Upper class, high SES. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So when our, our a huge concern with this too is that it's not just going to impact people with coronavirus, right? It's not just going to be people coming in with coronavirus. Our hospitals are already overwhelmed at times with different pre-existing conditions, medical conditions, Right? And they need access to medical care. There's people that, that are on dialysis, people that need, need to be seen regularly, that need to go to the ER for different conditions, right? And so what's going to happen when we have this crazy spread of this virus and people are going to hospitals? Who's going to get treatment? What's going to happen then? We already have a failing public health crisis in America before this happened. We were already in a state of crisis. What's going to happen when our medical facilities are inundated with not just this virus, but everything else going on? Right? So that's a huge part of the considerations here. So the quarantines, the shutting down of flights, the different measures being taken in China and Italy, they're a lot bigger than just protecting Right, this small group or maybe large group of young healthy adults that aren't going to be impacted about this. It's about so many other factors. Welcome to medical sociology. Oh, 
pregnant women who have contracts with other brands. Okay, so uh, Annabelle, um, it, no dumb questions. Um, any insight on pregnant women who have contracted coronavirus? Are they more susceptible? You literally go to the CDC site and they say they just don't know. They don't know how it's going to impact pregnant women. But they infer, based on the past, based on what we know about pregnant women, that they're more prone to illness and infection while they're pregnant because their immune system is low. So I would imagine that it would be quite scary if a pregnant woman contracted coronavirus and is suffering from a lower immune system. Um, so I, 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 think, I think it could be very scary, right? And at that point, you're not just dealing with, with a, a woman, you're dealing with an unborn child as well um, that could also have possibly have complications. So it's a big deal. Do you think that hospitals will isolate the staff if positive coronavirus comes up? Um, no, because, because, uh, because our hospitals right now are inundated with coronavirus. Um, one of our guest speakers that was supposed to come next week had to cancel. Um, he was going to come talk to you guys about the pharmaceutical industry and its impact on medical care. He had to cancel because they're so swamped at hospitals right now. They don't have enough providers uh, to help um, to, to help everyone. Let's see. I know what we can do. But... Okay. Um, I don't know who that is, but not a good comment. Okay. Um, Anyways, so what other questions do you guys have? Okay, Avrita said, how are hospitals hand handling this pandemic? I think they're just doing the best they can. They don't have they don't have enough tests. That's just the the reality. There's been funding measures uh, taken to increase spending on coronavirus test kits, but there's just not enough. So they're not really knowing if they're treating everyone with coronavirus. I think a lot of hospitals are treating everyone like they do have coronavirus um, and uh, putting on masks and sanitizing and so on and so forth. But it's it's a little bit of a mess right now who were turned away from overall. What's the update on COVID-19 patients who were turned away from overworld hospitals in China? I don't have that update for you. I'm sorry. Let's see. Kelly said they are, they're limiting patient contact rooms. Okay, so we talked about a lot here. Uh, let's see. Oh, where can we get oh, to make our own sanit? Where can we get alcohol to get our own sanitizer? Uh, honestly, we don't know because because uh, stores are sold out of alcohol right now and hand sanitizer. I went the other day to Target. I went to three different Targets and only one of them had hand sanitizer. I went at the very beginning when they opened and they only had like four sanitizing packs left um, and I bought a couple. Um, if I were you guys, I would go first thing in the morning. Um, uh, to go purchase and sanitizing and see if they have it. Um, not a lot of students around it. Okay, I'll go to that question next. Um, hand soap, though. Everyone's really set on hand sanitizer, um, but that's best to use if you're out and about, right? If you're home, just use hand soap. That's more effective, right? What we learned about infant mortality rates over the history of time is that doctors weren't washing their hands, right? And so that contributed to a lot of illness and death as well. So, so wash your hands, guys. Get some hand soap. That's, that's not as hard to find right now. Um, and if you're staying in, like like the hope is right now that you're not going out and about a lot, um, you should be able to get by with some travel packs of sanitizer while washing your hands at home. Yeah, so Alyssa said, I've heard liquid soap is more effective than hand sanitizer overall. Yeah, it is. So your best bet is to to wash your hands with uh, antibacterial soap and then save the hand sanitizer for when you go out. What do you think is the best way to help? Okay, so I've had some questions about what is the best way to help peers realize the importance of limiting social contact. That's really tough, especially at your age, being college students, where people just don't think it's a big deal. Um, I've really been impressed with everyone in this class. Um, I, I, I've just seen all of you guys just take this seriously and really be considerate of, of the rest of the population and what's going to be happening. And so um, really good job to all you guys. I'm just really, really, really proud. Um, to be in this class with you guys. So um, you guys have been doing awesome. I think you guys are all going to be doctors, right? Some of you have already been admitted to medical school. Some of you 
are applying right now, um, you guys are taking this really seriously. And and I think educate your peers, you know, tell them, be like, hey, you know, I just don't feel comfortable right now. I just, you know, and you might get some flack for it, um, but just well, you're going to get a lot of flack for a lot of stuff in your life. So you just have to make that, that judgment call. Is it more important to get a little flack on this? Um, be patient with people. Not everyone's taking medical sociology. Not everyone's going to be a doctor. Not everyone realizes the uh, the extent to the, uh, to which the situation is and um, I think it's just important to just be kind and just let people know don't shame them um, limiting social uh, yeah so I just just be kind tell them just be like yeah this is what's going on you, you know you don't have to get in a fight with your friends about it um, yeah so yeah let's see so 60% of flu symptoms ER visits test negative for flu just negative for flu, so could have been adenovirus or coronavirus. Yeah, totally. We're, we're like I said, shortage shortage of tests, a lot of unknown. We don't know how this is impacting people. It's best to just play it safe, guys. Um, you know, keep your distance. Don't go to these events. Don't go to frat parties if they're having them. Um, it's just not a good idea. You know. So, you, do you think medical schools will also close their campuses? Kind of concerned for the summer. Um, I'm not sure what medical schools are going to do because medicine's a whole different ballgame, right? Right now, when you're a doctor, you're literally, you're like a soldier. You're going into the field of battle. All, all doctors and nurses on deck right now. And this is what all of you guys are preparing to do, right? So um, I'm hoping medical schools don't shut down because we need med medical professionals being trained right now. Um, I would imagine they're going to find an effective way to teach um, and they're probably going to have some of the best um, sanitiz sanitizing methods as well for students. Uh, so someone said, I've heard medical students are stopping rounds. I'm not sure. Let's see. Is total isolation something that's completely necessary at this point in time? I still go to the gym, store, et cetera, which are huge gathering spots. But still, no, I don't think you have to be totally isolated. I think just go out when necessary, right? I mean, do you really have to go to the gym? Can you, you know, do like a workout video at home? Um, of course, you're going to have to go to the store. Go to the store, uh, wear a mask, wash your hands. Don't get too close to people. So someone said that, oh, Bell said the declining numbers seen in China are due to the authoritarian government enforcing strict regulations. What might it look like for our democratic government to lower the rates of infection? Uh, honestly, it looks like we're moving into really similar directions as Italy. Um, who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of months, but it, it sounds like the government declaring a state of emergency in various states and as a nation, the different measures we're taking, it sounds like we might be moving in that direction. <laughs> Okay, so to answer your guys' questions, um, Maya said that she has a friend in med school right now, and they are also doing online classes. Um, uh, do I think that it'll get so serious that stores have to close and everything closes? Well, in Italy, I know they have limited hours right now for stores, and then there's, like, certain distance rules, so that could happen. Chalk. Okay, it looks like chalk as well. Uh, someone said, hey, is it really bad to go to the gym at this point? Honestly, just use common sense, right? If you have access to a workout video, why not just do that right now when the whole world is taking precautions? Is it necessary to go to the gym right now? You know, I mean, the gym is the one place where everyone's going to be touching. You're probably going to get a lot of a lot of younger folks there as well that could be transmitting the virus, not even knowing that they have it because they're not going to see symptoms. So I think your best bet's not to do stuff like that, but it's it's your call. We're not in we're not in a military state right now where we're being being forced, but could get to that. <sighs> Far, uh, so Brian said, pharmacy, grocery store, and bank cannot close. There you have it. So there's going to be things that stay open. They might have limited hours. Um, but yeah. So take precautions. Um, use common sense. Be a wise steward. Be a wise citizen. Uh, global citizen. There, there's so much more at stake here. You guys are young and healthy. You likely will be okay. Um, but there's a lot of people around us that won't be okay. You guys also live in Orange near Santa Ana. You live among among one of the highest homeless populations in the nation. Think about them. You know how are they going to be impacted by this and access to medical care? So Cody said gyms have sanitizing wipes. It's up to you guys. Your call. Uh, 
within the is travel within the U.S. all right? I'm scheduled to go to Utah during spring break, and don't know if it will be okay. Um, I think what what the hope is right now with our country is people just stay put and just kind of go with their families. You know, I don't think like you're a bad person if you choose to travel. I don't think you're like purposely doing anything bad if you need to go. Like that's your right to go. Um, but they're having outbreaks there as well. Um, it's just a mess right now. Um, okay, someone's planning for Chicago. I personally, if I had a plane ticket right now to go somewhere, I wouldn't. I would stay put. You know, um, it's really tempting when the flights are so cheap right now to go to all these amazing places that you've always wanted to go to. Um, and you definitely can. There's plenty of people I see that are doing that. And like I said, they're not bad people. They're not trying to hurt anyone. They feel healthy and like they can handle it. Um, but again, that's how the virus can spread. Um, that's how it can harm vulnerable populations. That's how it can harm our global society at large. And um, it's probably best to limit your travel if possible. Um, but again, if you have hard set plans, if your family, whatever it is, I can't tell you what to do. And I don't think at this point anyone's going to tell you that you have to. But it could get to a place. Uh, uh, it could get to a point like Italy, and um, so it's totally up to you. Uh, I have no way of knowing about the domestic travel restrictions. That's that's not within my my scope right there. Um, I definitely think anything is possible at this point. Uh, someone at Chapman has coronavirus. I don't know about that either. I haven't gotten an email yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not sure if that's true, but I heard she tested positive this morning. Yeah. Okay. Uh, most airlines are offering some refund options at least. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys. So I think we covered the majority of the social factors. Um, we are going to, like I said, I'm going to be changing a lot of our assignments and our readings for the next several weeks. I'm going to cut out anything that... I determine is um, just extra reading because I want to lighten all of your load. Um, and I'm going to replace it with readings and videos that are more relevant to what we're experiencing right now. I think you'll be more interested. I think you'll absorb the information better. And I think it will also alleviate your workload. Um, I'm going to give you guys um, finalized um, syllabus with updates in the next probably two weeks, um, most definitely after spring, before spring break. Um, and we'll be moving to the Zoom platform next week as soon as our school purchases the licenses, um, which they don't have for all the professors yet. Um, okay, so any questions before we briefly go talk about MTALA? Going once, going to oh quizzes. Okay, so I'm gonna see how quizzes go. Um, as of right now, I'm not doing quizzes for the next couple of classes, um, so um, you don't have to worry about quizzes for the next couple of classes. But um, I'm gonna email you guys today about the specific readings that I do want you to do before next class. Next class, we were supposed to have a guest speaker, so I'm gonna try to have something else prepared for you guys for that day. Um, we were supposed to have John Flores come about um, the pharmaceutical industry, but he is called to serve at all the hospitals right now that are completely overwhelmed by coronavirus and other conditions that um, are being inundated because of coronavirus. Um, so I'm going to have, um, I'm going to email you guys today. Don't worry, you'll get all the information you need. Um, quizzes, I don't know. Um, we definitely won't be having the same format of quizzes that we've been having throughout the semester. Um, we're probably going to have, I'm probably going to pick like five important lectures that I feel the information is the most important for you guys to absorb. And based off of those lectures, um, I will have you guys probably either throughout the lecture, uh, either uh, throughout the lecture or after the lecture, I'll have you timestamps, uh, answers to specific questions relating to the lecture or specific readings that have been assigned. Um, so don't worry, you'll get all that information, but it'll be a little bit of a different format than it was before. At this point, I'm not doing quizzes for participation. I'm seeing that you're here and that you're interacting. Thank you guys all. You've all been really great at interacting. Um, and um, the important thing for me at this point, I've already seen, we're, we're halfway into the semester, I've already seen you guys master a lot of the material, which has been amazing. Um, you guys are super bright. 
Um, and I'm really impressed with that. And so now I'm just going to really weed it down to the very most important content for you guys um, so that you can effectively master the rest of the material as well as what's going on in our society because I think this will be very relevant um, to you as you proceed with your medical careers. Um, yeah, and so I'll get that all to you. So... Um, I will email you all that information. I have a specific group on Instagram where I'm going to continue to put updates for you guys. If anything is extremely vital to your grade, I'm going to email it out. Um, but it seems like so far on Instagram has been the best way to communicate with you guys without not, um, with not being in classes. Presentations coming up. Um, so I, the presentation that was for this class today, I had a Skype meeting with them right before class, um, and that went fine. So um, I think we'll either do that or if we have Zoom set up, we'll try to figure it out via Zoom. So continue with your presentations that you're doing. If you have a partner that's left town, call them over the phone, figure out the presentation, email them back and forth, and then if we're on Zoom, we'll be able to do that. Um, so it should work out. And then just email me individually um, for the ones coming up within the next week. Um, but the ones that are further out, I think you'll be fine. We'll be on Zoom by then. Okay, so we've only got about... I think like seven minutes before Instagram shuts down the platform. Um, so I wanted to briefly go over Mtella because we would have gone in over it more if we had more time. Um, but Mtella is something really important for you guys to know about. It's important for patients to know about. It's important for doctors, PAs, nurses to know about. Who knows what Mtella is? Who can tell me real quick? Shoot it out. I'm just going to, emergency medical treatment and labor act, okay? If you go to an ER, you, they have to treat you, yep, okay? Patients cannot be denied emergency medical treatment, yep, in emergency departments. To prevent patient dumping, yep, protects patient rights in ER, yes. Law that says if someone goes to the emergency department, they must be treated, insurance or not, yes. Ensuring public access to medical emergency treatments, yes. A federal law that requires anyone coming to an ER department to be treated, yes. Allows many people to go to emergency room despite insurance, yep. Provides emergency treatment, yep. Okay, okay, good. Okay, good. You guys got the gist. Okay, so Intel is legislation, right? What protects us in our country? We talked about this. Disability rights, ageism, sexism. Racism, we're protected by legislation in those domains, right? So we have legislation called MTALA that helps to support patient rights within hospitals and also obviously um, keeps doctors and other uh, practitioners accountable. Okay? Um, so we had our great group here that put together the key points for us. I'm going to email out this to everyone just so you have it. Um, the three main obligations of MTELA. Can you guys tell me what those are um, for my group that presented? I'm going to have them type it in there while I say it. So the three main obligations emergency departments have under MTELA are, one, every person who comes to an ER and requ uh, then requests to be treated must receive medical screening to see whether a medical emergency exists. Two, if a medical emergency exists, ER must treat the patient until they are stabilized, no matter what. Three, if a hospital is specifically equipped to treat a condition, it must accept transfers from hospitals that are not. Okay? So that's important, too, once we go into, like, the pharmaceutical industry and the whole business of the medical industry. This has become an important piece of legislation because it's become so corporatized, right? <clears throat> so what was the purpose of MTALA? The purpose was to ensure non-discriminatory patient access to emergency medical care and prevent hospitals from dumping patients to public hospitals solely for financial reasons. Okay. So, what can you do if you feel like your MTALA rights have been violated? We don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to go into it, but you guys can keep typing. Um, if you feel like your MTALA rights as a patient have been violated, you can file a complaint with the hospital. And remember, we talked about this earlier in the semester, right? So, if you're, if you're a physician, a nurse, whatever, 
and you've had a complaint filed against you, remember what happens. Guys, remember? Remember we talked about peer review? Report to the hospital board, yep, uh-huh, complaint, uh-huh. So if a patient files a complaint, first of all, the problem is a lot of patients don't even know they can do this, right? And so it's your moral obligation as a practitioner to serve patients to the quality of this legislation. But just know you might have a medical sociology professor come into your ER and you won't know because she's got four kids and you won't know that she knows she can file a complaint and then you'll be like, shoot, darn it. You know, I would just treat every patient as if they know what I'm telling. Anyways, you can, fi you can file a complaint. And once you file a complaint, the hospital is supposed to take it very seriously, right? And then they take you to peer review, which means that they go around um, to different physicians within the hospital that they know don't have a close relationship with you. They know that you're best friends with Betty, so they're not going to send it to Betty, your best friend that's the ER nurse or the ER uh, physician. They're going to send it to the Chuck, the one that they know never sees you guys have different shifts and you have no relationship. And they're going to send it around to those physicians and they're going to go through the steps of how you treated and evaluated the patient. And they're going to say, did you do it right? And if they found an error in your procedure, then you could potentially uh, have your contract stopped. Um, but before that happens, usually what the hospital will do is they'll give you a chance to write back a report saying, hey, um, a big, big, big part of medical school, guys, remember, right? A big part of medical school is accountability, taking accountability for what you've done, what you've done wrong, and being able to self-evaluate. And that's why we do a lot of the presentations with the evaluations. Uh, and so um, it'll go through that, that chain of evaluation. If they can see that you can take accountability and admit to your wrong so that they can see that it doesn't happen again, likely you'll be okay for the first time. But if it continues to happen, then they will most likely not contract with you anymore. Okay, so that's MTALA. Um, I know it's not a lot. I think we're going to be kicked off soon. Um, before I get kicked off, um, anything else that you guys um, have questions about, go ahead and type them. While I'm waiting for questions, I'm going to say that we are going to change some of the readings. We're going to go over the, the Spanish flu of 1918. We're going to go into SARS. We're going to go into many of the pandemic and epidemics, which we were not going to go into so that you guys can have better context about um, why we're experiencing what we're experiencing and why it's a big deal. Um, okay, I have 21 seconds. So at this point, send me a message on uh, email or Instagram and I'll answer your questions. Thanks guys for coming to Medical Sociology today. I'm really impressed with how quick you guys have been to respond to everything um, and really grateful for you guys being such an awesome class. So thanks, bye.